I was just reading a book by Walter Scheidel called The Great Leveler. Yeah, mm, very good. Excellent funny. book. Mm, it is an excellent book. And one of the things he did was an empirical analysis of left versus right wing governments, I think across the 20th century, but it might have gone farther back than that to see if there was any difference in the Gini coefficient across the classes of government. And what he found was that there was no difference whatsoever. He makes a fairly strong case that the only redistributive techniques that work are um, pestilence and war, essentially. And that's because they knock everyone down to zero. But you're making a different case, like an incremental case in some sense, which is that governments, perhaps regardless of their ideological proclivities in the 20th century, as they've become more wealthy, they have incrementally devoted a larger part of their uh, of their resources to incremental improvements in, you might think about it as investment in the future <clears throat> rather than redistribution or investment in social capital, education and, and healthcare and those sorts of things that well, it's probably some it's probably some combination. It's a combination of investment in public goods because, of course, the whole society is better off if uh, if everyone's educated. Uh, also, insurance people support uh, a, a safety net. That's the most popular euphemism for social spending because you never know whether it's going to be you or your or, or, or your mother or your brother who's going to be uh, who's going to be in need um, in, in the, the the lottery of misfortune. Uh, and then part of it part of it is is uh, is charity. The, the, the modern conscience. Uh, won't allow the little match girl to freeze to death, right? Or the uh, the Jodes to, uh, to 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 bury Grandpa by the side of Route sixty six, uh, and so I think social spending has been pushed along by by uh, all three. Uh, right. It hasn't necessarily in, in some countries it probably has reduced the Gini coefficient in, in Western European countries, which have a more uh, aggressive system of taxation than than the United States or, or uh, Canada. But more important than the Gini distribution is that it's reduced the number of people living in poverty, which right. I argue the morally relevant measure in any case. Yeah, so, well, those two things are complicated because obviously you want to raise people out of abject poverty. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a zero argument proposition and that seems to be happening very rapidly. The, the, the question after that, I suppose, is to what degree does the remaining degree of inequality that's generated by productive capitalist systems also constitute a social threat? Because there is evidence, I think it was reviewed best by in the spirit level, that as inequality increases, rates of male homicide, for example, increase, and, and all sorts of other negative measures. So there's some weird interaction between raising absolute levels of wealth and ensuring that inequality doesn't, I don't know, exceed some hypothetical optimum that, that, that needs to be considered in social policy. And yeah, there are, there, I, I cite some skeptical reanalyses of the, uh, the data in okay. uh, the, the spirit level. And uh, probably absolute uh, prosperity matters more than uh, inequality in determining uh, social health, uh, such as happiness, crime, um, other kinds of social pathologies like drug addictions. Uh, it's, it's not easy to, te to uh, tease them apart. No, because, no, definitely you know, not. Countries, you know, countries like Sweden are uh, very egalitarian, but they're also very rich. And right, Like right. Uganda are uh, more lopsided, but they're also <laughs> very poor. And so it takes a little bit of statistical wizardry to, to tie them apart. And my reading of the literature is that it's actually prosperity that is more important than, uh, than inequality. But also, and this is a, a, a point that uh, in the psychological literature was, was uh, uh, emphasized by Christina Starmans and uh, Paul Bloom, that what people sometimes think of as an, uh, as an aversion to uh, inequality, to people having different amounts, is actually an aversion to unfairness. Uh -huh, right, to injustice. That, yeah, that that what people what really infuriates people is that they think that the people at the top have ill-gotten gains. Right. People, if they sense that the system is basically fair, that either greater um, effort, talent, or even luck uh, result in an unequal distribution, uh, an impartial lottery, for example, they're, they're okay with that. It's cheating that really gets under. Yeah, and people are really good at re remembering cheating and recognizing it as well, and it sticks in mind. Yeah, so, so okay, so there's something we could talk about for a minute because, you know, there's a, the, the, there's political, what do you call, rumblings about the fact that I, I think a lot of this is generated by the radical left types, particularly on the campuses, that the system is rigged and that it's an oppressive patriarchy and that the reason that people are at the top is because they played power games. And, you know, it's this, my sense is that the control is that we're, 
were ethnic or racial or gendered groups and were competing in the Marxist manner, and those who win have won because of oppression. But I know the literature on the relationship between individual, individual differences and long-term life success in, in the Western world, and the literature is actually very clear. So intelligence seems to account for about 20% of the variance in long-term life success. And then trait conscientiousness accounts for perhaps another maybe 10 to 15%. And then there are smaller contributions of emotional stability um, and also of trait openness, which seems to be a good predictor of entrepreneurial ability. So it looks like in the West that you can attribute about 40 to 50% of the variance. Maybe that's a little high, but it's, it's, not, it's not a radical overestimate to the sorts of individual differences that are associated with productivity because increases in IQ, higher IQ, and higher conscientiousness definitely make people more productive. It seems to me that you can use that as an index of the, um, of the, of the genuinely meritocratic nature of a culture and also as an index of its willingness to engage in fair play because you'd expect if, if your culture is aimed at productivity and it turns out that those are the most and it turns out that the most productive people are in fact differentially rewarded, that seems to me to be a reasonable index of the success of the society. Now, that data still leaves 50 to 60% of the variance unexplained. And so you can, in there, you could include racism and prejudice and the tyranny of the system and blind luck and physical health and all the arbitrary and random events that make up, that determine whether someone is successful or fails in life. But it does seem to me to provide a metric saying that not only is our society crazily productive and reasonably and, and reasonably good at distri distributing the spoils, even though there's still some inequality, but that a fair bit of the inequality is actually generated as a consequence of differences in genuine productivity. Does that seem reasonable to you? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it ought to be obvious and, and banal, except for the fact that in a lot of intellectual life, the assumption is that the correlation between uh, psychological traits and success is zero. So the fact that it's you know, let's say it's 40%, let's even say it's 33%. Uh, that's a lot higher than, than most people are willing to uh, acknowledge. And what you said is exactly right. That leaves uh, more than half of the variance not to be correlated mm -hmm. uh, with individual differences. And of course, uh, various inequities could go into that at that 50 or 60%. And, and uh, there's no, they're not mutually exclusive. Uh, it seems hard. Uh, uh, we, we know that there's a lot of gaming of the system, particularly in the United States, by, by the wealthy, uh, and that should obviously be eliminated. It's not meritocratic, it's not fair, it's not productive. One could also ask uh, another question, is uh, whether the rewards that go to the talented are necessarily in sectors that lead to what we might call uh, productivity in the sense of, of um, increasing societal wealth. And an argument can be made that there's some misallocation of intellectual resources, that we have, uh, that the economy uh, is, is uh, too, too driven by, by finance, that the, uh, there are too many lawsuits, the legal system is to each other. Uh, and so uh, we're estimated by intellectuals. This does still leave a, a place for criticizing a number of the, uh, uh, the ways in which our economy is set up. There's always um, scope for improvement.